David. Um, I've already seen a bunch of people that I've known or met in the past, and I appreciate the fact that you're here. Um, th we believe on faith. I, I just want to say that at the beginning. Sometimes people think that as a biologist, because of my position, that I can prove to people that God created. Other than the scriptures, I can't do that. I can show you that there is a very reasonable way to look at the evidence that's different from the general theory of evolution, but I'm never going to be able to prove it to you scientifically. So you need to understand that on the front end. I don't. There's a lot of debate that goes on. You don't have to go too far on the internet to recognize uh, that there's a lot of stuff on this, um, and um, just it's more than I could ever keep up with. So I stopped trying to keep up with it. I actually developed my particular position when I was taking advanced evolutionary theory at the University of Louisville. And uh, that was when I first recognized that there was a difference between the evidence that we were looking at and the interpretations of that evidence. And, uh, and I'll come back through that story over this series. Now, I can't do everything tonight. And uh, on no given night will I be able to do everything. I won't be able to repeat everything uh, on every night. So if people have missed, you just need to tell them that uh, we're going to try to, uh, I'm going to try to give you the series the way I did it when I was in Columbia, uh, Missouri, which, of course, I spoke with an entirely different accent when I was there, <laughs> or at least when I came back. Anyway, so... Um, but it, it, it's a good one because it focuses on the overheads that I use. And I have no way to say anything about them except without the images, I can't explain this to people. And I've tried to write this before without as many images. But the truth is, every one of those pictures really speaks when I'm explaining it. Everybody gets it. And it's this is not something that's going to go over your head. Well, it might if you go to sleep, but it will not go over your head. These kids right here are going to understand what I'm talking about just because of the biology that they've had. So um, I always, I had an a elder at Expressway named L.L. L. Dukes, and he, he told me one time, he said, David, you kind of got over people's head today. I said, really? He, he said, yeah, you, you kind of got above their, our, their heads. He says, if you put the fodder down where the calves can get it, the cows can get it too. And I never, never left my mind about that. So I always try to speak to the audience uh, that I'm speaking to. And uh, remember that not everybody has the same background that I have uh, or has the same sweater by the way, I tend to joke. It's, it is really difficult for me to go too long without being ridiculous. So just be patient with me. Um, when I first started studying this, this was a book by R.L. Wysong. This was the cover of the book. I've cleaned it up a little bit, made it a little bit sharper for people to see. But it was a book on creation and evolution. And that was the controversy. If you go to Amazon and you look for creation and evolution, the first hundred pages will, will have a title that is either or. You're either a creationist or you're an evolutionist. And that's a hundred pages of 25 at a time. So it, it is amazing to me. And I believe that that's one of the problems that we have. If you look at it as an either or, you don't think that there's any part of it that you could possibly believe, uh, then your approach is going to be very different. And I'll come back to that over and over again, but I'm going to try to go through this in a way that I introduce two specific things that I want you to learn. And then on the last session, I'll have the test. Yeah. But the test will bo basically be about these two particular things I want you to learn. I'm going to tell them to you, then I'm going to tell them to you, then I'm going to tell you what I told you. And that's what we'll be doing through this whole thing. The trouble is that, that when people ask you, are you a creationist or an evolutionist, we want to say creationist just like that. And for many people that you're talking to, that's the end of the discussion. 
I'm an evolutionist. I believe in evolution. It's scientifically proven. You know, you live, you, you're, you're actually uh, acting on the basis of faith, and I'm, a, I'm acting on the basis of facts. End of discussion. So I'm going to show you a way to deal with that so that you can have a second discussion and a third discussion and a fourth discussion. There's a lot of topics that have to be covered, uh, and that's why I have to do this as a series. So I keep it simple, just like I did with my students. Um, the first day of class, I just have to throw this in. The first day of class, I'm up on the stage. You know, I had them give me a stage because I'm too short. It makes me look bigger. Anyway, I'm up on the stage, and I ask, uh, I ask them to turn. I don't ask them anything about their cell phones, but at 10 minutes into the thing, I have my wife call me. And I answer it, and, and I say, got to take this. And I start talking to her, you know, yeah, I love you too, you know. She may not be on the phone at that point. She just calls. Or my former student worker who works for her it calls me. But it makes the point. They never have a problem with the cell phone stuff after that. So just something you might think about. All right, so let's, look, let's just look through this. Uh, I, I would take questions during the sessions themselves, except that it, sometimes I'm going to cover that very thing someplace down the line, and I just can't answer all those questions right now. At the end, if you've got some questions, you can ask them or you can leave and just write something down, and I'll try to deal with it at some point. You know, some of the things you're going to ask, I will be covering. And that's what makes this series more difficult for people. Just that. But if, if I ask you to answer this question, are you an evolutionist or a creationist? As I said, you're going to say what? I'm a creationist. All right. Like I said, that pretty much ends the discussion with most of the people that I ever talked to, many of whom obviously had PhDs in biology. So I always would say, yes. Yes, I am. And they look at me kind of strange uh, again. For a different reason they look at me strange and they don't what do you mean i said yes i am and they said well are you an evolutionist or creationist i say yes well now that gives me a chance to talk to them again because it turns out that the bible teaches natural selection without a doubt teaches it in the old testament a long time ago by people that everybody wants to say were rather ignorant and uh so i'll just mention that in passing, but if you go back to Genesis 30 and 31 in the story about Laban and uh, Jacob and the changing of his wages, and it was all in the types of cattle that he got, and he kept, he knew that every time he got it, his, his just, he had plenty, you know, and Laban didn't have very many, and he knew that wasn't natural. He knew right off that wasn't natural. That's why he recognized it was a miracle. You have to know natural before you can understand the concept of a miracle. So the idea that you could change cattle uh, by breeding them in a certain way was certainly known to them, and that's natural selection. Now, that doesn't mean I believe everything about evolution, because I certainly don't. But one of the things that I'm going to teach you is that there are three theories. There are actually three theories of evolution. All three of them have to be proven individually. You have to get life from non-life, all right? You have to have a mechanism that shows change without limits, without limits, okay? So far, we've only found natural selection, which always shows change within limits. And then the third thing is that you, you have to show that this sweep from an amoeba to man, after you've gotten, after you've gotten life, that from the simplest life to where we are today, you have to prove that that could possibly have happened. And that ends up being a tremendous uh, difference in interpretation of evidence. So how many theories are there? Let my hand go up. Three, th three theories of evolution. What's the first one? Life from non-life, which I call chemical evolution, by the way. It's the idea of just going from nothing to something Something that is not alive to something that is alive. 
That's the first one. Never has been proven. Never yet has been proven. All right, the second one is the idea of having a mechanism of change without limits, which I call special evolution. Well, actually, none of the terms that I use come from creationists in my entire series. They all come out of my books. I never use a term that was, that was uh, coined by a creationist. So you need to know that, because that's not who I'm, that's not who I'm, uh, I'm not copying their stuff. I, this is my own thinking. All right, and so I took these straight from my textbooks all the way up through, well, forever. I've been doing it ever since I started being a biologist. And the third thing is, we, ha we are told that there is this sweep of life in general evolution, but what you're gonna find is there are just gaps upon gaps upon gaps in the record itself. And how you explain that, uh, uh, sometimes there's no good explanation on either part, all right? There's as many problems trying to explain it one way as, as the other way. So we're gonna look at all three of those. So this is, this is my first suggestion to you that you basically, when somebody says, are you an evolutionist or a creationist, you just say, yes, I am. And after you've gone through this series, you'll be able to talk to them about the difference between chemical, general, and special evolution. Now, are you good with that? That's where we're headed. Okay. Now, this is what I believe. All right. You can probably do this from memory. Sanctify the Lord your God in your hearts, be ready always to give an answer to everyone that asks you a question or a reason of the hope that's in you. Now, is this a suggestion? No, it's not a suggestion. It's, it's what we're supposed to do. People say, well, I don't want to learn about evolution and creation, but that's the thing that's drawing so many people away from God. They become agnostic at least, you know, they get disappointed with the problems within uh, organized religion, the hypocrisy. So they choose to go to football games and sit in the middle of a bunch of hypocrites. But they can't do that at church. Of course, there are people that are not what they're supposed to be. You'll find that every place. But the point is, this is not a suggestion. This is actually something we're supposed to do. So we're going to set apart the Lord God in our hearts. We're going to be ready always to give an answer to anybody who ask, anybody who ask you a reason of the hope that's in you, including PhD biologists. And I'm gonna give you some things where you can actually do that. And that's it, the reason of the hope that's in you. Well, I didn't put the whole verse up there, so what's the rest? With meekness and fear. I'm gonna tell you on the front end of this that if you get into a religious discussion with anybody you begin to get hot under the collar and upset, you have a problem. That is just not appropriate. It's just not appropriate. I can understand Jesus driving people out of his temple in the same way I can understand God destroying a nation because of their ungodliness. They had violated all of his laws, but he never got mad. He just looked he looked right through the outside of people to their heart. And no matter how difficult it is to talk to someone, if you will talk to them with meekness and fear, recognizing that you are talking to someone who has a soul that needs to be saved, you'll do a whole lot better. Don't take it personally. They're not upset with you. They're upset with God. I'm pretty sure Moses got that lesson. <laughs> you can go back and check. Well, anyway, it's with meekness and fear, and it means that we're supposed to have a reasoned faith. Can't give a reason without being reasoned. With meekness and fear, or gentleness and uh, peace, or gentleness and love, I think it is, in some of the other translations. So this is what I believe. Make no mistake about it. Do I believe that God created it in, in one week? Yes, I do. Six days. Rested on the seventh. Do I believe that there was a flood? like the Genesis flood, absolutely. And the reason is that if I believe in the, in the six days of creation, and I believe that those were literal days, I also believe that in three literal days, Jesus was raised from the dead. So if I'm going to believe that, I have to believe this. You can't take one and throw the other out. 
So you have to be consistent with your beliefs and not get swayed by, you know, popular thinking that, and slide yourself off someplace against what the Bible says. It's a faith issue. You know, faith is simple. You know, I, I went to Costa Rica with my, uh, PH, my uh, under my PhD, my biology professor, uh, we studied mosses. Isn't that exciting? We studied mosses, and uh, that's my, quote, expertise. I didn't say moths. I said mosses. There's a difference. So anyway, we went down to Costa Rica, and we got up into the mountains, and we were collecting during the time we were there. We were there for three weeks. I kept telling everybody I was going to Costa Rica, and uh, I was going to go on Loxa Airlines. And I kept telling them I was going to go. I had faith that I was going to go. But I didn't demonstrate my faith till I got on the plane. You can say you have faith, but there's going to come a time when you have to demonstrate that you have that faith. And that is what faith actually is. It is when you are living it out and demonstrating it in your life. You don't have to be angry with people when you ask questions or say, I don't agree with you even if they get angry with you. And that is hard to learn. That is one of the toughest things to learn, particularly if you're married. Uh, attitude in discussions is so important. So one of the problems I have is that when you look at the titles of the books and so on, it, it's always this either or. And I don't know how to get people away from it except to teach them that there are three theories and you believe one of them because it's in the Bible. Simple statement. All right, so this is really an age-old debate between natural creation and supernatural creation. But I want to just say one thing about that as we're talking about it. When you talk about supernatural, I don't like to say, I understand why people say this, but I never like to say that it is a cessation of natural law to have a miracle. Because when Jesus was walking on the water, that was his physical body in the air, walking on the surface of liquid water, all of those things were real. So what was the miracle? It was, it was God himself adding another element to that. And physicists understand this immediately. You know, you have forces, you have the little arrows, and you get an extra force in there, and then it changes everything. And so I really like to say that there's an extra force by God who created the natural world, all right? And it's, it's not a cessation, it's just an extra force that's there. Sometimes God's part in it is pretty obvious, like walking on the water or changing the water to wine. But uh, when it comes to the manna in the wilderness or the quail in the wilderness, you might be able to explain the quail on the basis of a migration. But the fact that that migration happened at that time and continued at that time, that's something else. That's, that's the power of God that's been added into the natural realm. So anyway, I just wanted to point that out. A lot of people have trouble with it. And of course, I was always trying to show people that it's possible for a modern scientist to actually uh, believe the biblical account of the creation. This is not me, because I don't do math. I can just tell you that right now. I'm going to skip over this one. Uh, we'll come back to it at some point, but not tonight. And th this is just to show you sort of the scope from the idea of uh, the idea of a supernatural creation goes all the way back to people who believe in a in a flat Earth or their geocentrist, you know, young Earth creationist. And then when you get over on this end, you go all the way to evolution. Okay, and so. These are these philosophical ways of looking at the evidence, but if you have to you look at the evidence through your own philosophy. So two people that are looking at the same evidence may pick the same one of these, but they're looking at it from their own point of view. So that confuses the whole situation. So the agnostic will be looking at all of these terms differently than somebody who's a biblical literalist or someone who's a secular humanist, et cetera, et cetera. So I just want you to understand that because there's a lot of ideas out there that we could talk about. 
All right, so I want to talk about chemical evolution, special evolution, and general evolution. And uh, I believe that God created. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. I believe that everything that is used to not be, and God brought it into existence by speaking it into existence. I have no problem with that, even though my science background would say, oh, David, surely not. Okay, believe me, the surely not can get pretty rough sometimes. <laughs> In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And the alternative to that that is offered is this life coming out of a, a primordial soup or ocean or what have you. So let's start with the creation week. It was a miracle. I can't take the miracle out of it any more than I can take the miracle out of having your sins cut away by God in baptism. That's not a work of ours. It's an obedience. All right. You know, if you if you go to the store and get this, uh, you know, I'll give you a hundred dollars. I'd have people lining up all over the place. Well, I don't really want to go to that store. I don't like Kroger or whatever it happens to be. If I ask you to jump in this barrel of water, I'll give you $1,000. They would jump in the barrel of the water, all right? And if, you, if you'll let me dip you in this water and you actually believe in Christ, God will take your sins away. That's, that's not a work of man. You can jump in the water, but you can't make your sins go away. So the creation week and all sorts of things in the Bible are miracles. When somebody says that they are a person of faith, you can say to them, oh, then you believe that God created, and it was a miracle, and you believe in the flood, and you believe that Jesus was raised after three days by the, by the power of God from the dead. You believe that his mother was a virgin when she had him. And you can go through any of the miracles that you want to, and all of a sudden they'll begin to put their hands up and say, no, I don't believe that nonsense. Well, when you take the miracles out of the Bible, it completely comes unthread. Uh, the threads out, those threads out of the Bible, it comes unwoven. And there's no value to it. I remember watching a preacher one time who was talking about an issue, and he said, well, if you believe that, then this verse you can't believe. And the guy said, yes, yeah, so he tore it out and threw it away. And he did that about 35 times. <laughs> and he says, ah, just threw the Bible away. Because basically when you start picking and choosing like that, you don't believe the Bible. You're trying to make the Bible teach what you believe. The creation week was a, was a miracle. It was seven 24-hour periods. I'll show you that as we go along. And when he, when he got done, it was finished. It's not still going on. As many uh, general, evol general evolutionists have shifted over to theistic evolutionism, the idea that God's still creating. And I, the Bible is very clear. When it was done, it was done. He's spoken into existence, and it was. All right, what's the disagreement about? Well, the disagreement has to do with the evidence. It has to do with how we arrange the evidence. It's just like a trial. You put the evidence out on the table, you arrange it, and then you interpret that arrangement. You're doing it, and I'm doing it. My science friends are doing it, and everybody has a right to do it. People may think you're crazy, but you have a right to do it. You know, if you want to eliminate the whole concept of God and love and kindness and things like that from the idea of humans, that's fine. All right? I'm not, I'm not going to make somebody, I'm not going to take a gun and make them come to church. No value at all. But this is the real reason that we're disagreeing. You know, we have to select evidence. We don't always select the same evidence. How we arrange it is very different. How we interpret it is very different. You know, and we've seen that in every court case. We'll get back to that. We're going to go through these evidences, and I'm going to touch on comparative anatomy, the fact that if you stand an ape up here, I look a lot like you. I have hair. You know, I don't stoop. My mom made me stand up straight. But the point is, there's a lot of things that are similar. Our digestive systems are similar. Our bone structure is similar. Our eyes are similar. Our whole visual system. Every system of my body is pretty much reflect, reflected in, in, in an ape, in a chimpanzee, whatever you want to want to say. In fact, it is in a frog, too. Why do we study frogs in school? 
fetal pigs and things like that because we can learn about our own bodies. Actually, I'm not too, not too hepped up on the idea of a surgeon learning the body by cutting up a human. I just as soon let them start on a fetal pig, you know, and figure out where all the stuff is. So we're going to talk about the similarities. We're going to talk about genetics, which is where we'll come upon special evolution. We'll talk specifically about fossil men. We'll talk some about vestigial organs, which is not an argument anymore. We'll talk about the fossil record and the age of the earth. All of these came to me uh, exactly like that from my advanced evolutionary theory professor. Now, I had, because of my beliefs, I actually had to take undergraduate evolution and advanced evolutionary theory. That was required by the department because I believed that God could have created in seven days, six days. And that's fine. I was okay with that. And for the record, I made an A in both of them. All right. So it isn't like I sloughed off or fought with the professor. I decided, okay, I'll learn what you have to say. I will put that back down on the test. And then I will tell you how I interpret this. And I felt like that was the best way to do it. It certainly worked out that way. All right. So uh, if you just look at a court case, basically, if you think about it as natural creation and general evolution, that's what we're kind of facing. Here's the evidence. And we're looking at it from the idea of a supernatural creation with special evolution, natural selection occurring. And we're interpreting the evidence differently. Lots of court cases. The only reason that there is a hung jury or the person has to be released is simply because both sides can explain the evidence equally well. And secondly, they cannot eliminate the other view. And that's where we are. I guarantee you, you're not going to be able to eliminate the other view until somebody by faith comes to God. And they're not coming to God by faith through their science courses. They're coming by faith to God through the scriptures. And at some point in here, I want to talk about why I'm not a theistic evolutionist. That'll be another one of our talks. And I want to talk very specifically about how we got the Bible so I can dispel this idea that somehow there are mistakes in it. And I can show that to you easily. I don't know why more people don't use this approach, but it is a very easy thing to show that it is almost incomprehensible to believe that there are errors in the Bible just because of the way we got it. And I'll show you that as we go along. So anyway, you see where I'm going. We're going to look at evidence and interpretation. And we're going to do it in all of those areas. And we're going to explain the difference between chemical, special, and general evolution. Is that clear? Now I can go faster. Okay, we've got our terms down. Oh, yes. When I was in my advanced evolutionary theory class, he put, he put that chart up in front of me. And he said, now, David, this is the evidence for evolution. Where's your evidence? And my little snappy comeback was, uh, the, I had no answer for that. And when you don't have an answer, it's very easy to try to get something out there that you're going to be embarrassed by later. It's really a mistake to open your mouth at that time. So you just learn to say, all right. I don't have an answer right now. Can you give me some time? And you say it in a nice way, and they say, sure. And that's the way I handled it all the way through my school. I just said, don't have an answer for that. Let me think about it for a while. They were always gracious, and they let me do it. And when I came back with an answer, they may not have agreed with my interpretation, but they respected the way I'd gone at it. I don't want you to misunderstand. I loved my professors. These were good people. You know, they may not have given credit to God for the good things they did, but they were good people, and ultimately they all treated me well. People that I thought would, other people might have dealt with it differently and they'd have never had any respect from those people, but they always respected me, even though they thought I was crazy. <laughs> That's all I ever asked my wife to do. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> we've been together 50 years. Oh, anyway, so this was his evidence for evolution. So does anybody have an idea what I might have thought about? 
since I already put it up there a minute ago? How would you answer that? Here's the evidence for evolution. Where's your evidence? It's the same, same evidence. That's my evidence of creation. Creation. Pardon me. And that was when I finally came back. And in advanced evolutionary theory, I was actually required to do a special presentation for uh, the heads and the faculty and the uh, graduate students of uh, biology and psychology. I don't think that was legal. Today, it would not have been legal to add an extra requirement to me or to make me do that, but I did it. John Clark went in, he talked about the biblical aspects. If you don't know John Clark, he's one of the great uh, preachers and ministers in the church. And uh, he's the one, he is the reason that I was able to do this, because he was there when I was going through this. So I had somebody to bounce all of these ideas off of. And he's the one who said, I think you're being too lenient. And I said, well, I think you're being too strict. And it was kind of good to, to strike our heads together that way. But I ended up, I went back in and I went through every one of these areas. I showed the evidence without anybody's interpretation. I showed the evidence with the strongest general evolutionary interpretation I could. And then I showed the evidence with my interpretation. When I got done with that presentation, that professor said to me, well, David, you did what I didn't think you could do. You showed that it was a matter of faith. What more could you ask? He went back on it the next class period, but he said it to me at the end of the presentation. Never offered anything after that. So anyway, that's kind of where that's kind of where I'm coming from in my background. So it's not fact versus faith. The issue is which position position of faith is more reasonable based on your own interpretation of the facts, and it includes everything in your life. What does what's the Bible say about personal relationships with our children and our wives and our friends and our neighbors? That's not covered in science. It's just not a science. You know, that's just not a science thing. But uh, I will say this, as far as I can tell, we are the only species on the face of the earth that can actually have fun killing somebody, who can actually plan and have fun killing somebody. When these animals are eating one another, that's part of God's uh, plan for food, food, that's all. They're not thinking about, oh, this is going to be fun. I think I'll torture this one for a while. That's a human thing. The other thing that is unique about humans is, as far as I know, we're the only ones who can actually reflect on our own death. We are unique. There's, there's many things that are unique. There is not one dog here today. Have you noticed that? We all have dog cats. How many people have dog cats? There you go. Why didn't you bring them? Wouldn't they be interested in this discussion? You know? I have, a, I have a friend who has lizards. She drives me crazy. <laughs> She's got lizards. But she wouldn't bring lizards to this. But if you have an animal who is really interested in this, or perhaps a corn plant, let them come. I'll do the best I can to speak corn. I'll do, corny, corny is one of those words that's been applied to me. All right. I always love this statement by Joseph Epstein. If you scratch a cynic, Underneath, as often as not, you're going to find a dead idealist. Now, that was for the preachers in here. <laughs> Think about it. So what I want to do is use a little bit of example here about comparative anatomy and physiology. So how would you, how would you look at the evidence of this similarity? Well, you know, the evidence without any interpretation is that all animals have life organized as cells. You have... 60 trillion cells in your body. When you were born, you had 3 trillion cells in your body. But you still have 60 trillion cells in your body. They are all alive. They cannot live without being in connection with all of the others. All right? And all the systems, you know, are made of atoms that are put together as molecules that are put together 
uh, as tissues, it, and all the tissues make up organs and organ systems and then organisms and so on. There's a hierarchy of organization that is there in all living things. And it all starts with living cells. Chemical evolution says you can go from non-life to a living cell, but that's never been proven. It has to stand on its own. You can't just say, well, I believe this, so I think that happened. You have to show that that happened. It's never been done. So anyway, all animals are alike. There's, that's just a statement of fact. You find that the larger groups, although they may not look the same on the outside, they have similar organ systems, many basic similarities in the physiology, the chemical properties, you know, will parallel the morphologic features, the outside look of the <coughs> organism. As far as I can tell, those are all quotes out of my book, and they are all quotes that simply show evidence. All right, so what do we got? Horse and man. See any similarities? Or are they just different? Some people say they just aren't the same. I want you to understand that God had to, God had to put a system together where every organism had to have a food source which pretty much all the time is another organism, right? So we'll get back to that in a minute. So here we have it. We've got a horse and a man, incredible similarity. You know, and this is the reason why surgeons and doctors study other organisms' internal stuff, because it's so much like ours. They go back and they say all this stuff about embryos, and I still see this in the books, but the truth is this is kind of fading out. Because the way our embryo develops is not like this, and we never had gills. There's not one part of an embryo that ever had gills, no matter how many times you hear somebody say that. It isn't that. However, there are real similarities right here. Fish, frogs, reptiles, and mammals, and birds. Um, this is the brain. If you straighten it out, you basically have the same parts. Yeah, and when you call that guy bird brain, this is what you're saying right here. All right. So there is a similarity in the structures even within the brains. I got interested because these are hearts. I don't even remember what book I took it out of. It was some kind of advanced, advanced, advanced uh, comparative anatomy book. And they had this chart in there, and they had it all going back here. And I looked at this, and I asked somebody one day, I said, well, where are the pictures of all this stuff here? And they said, we don't have it. So this is the evidence. They go from the current from what we know now and they reason backwards not with any evidence they just reason backwards that's fine I don't mind if somebody wants to do it but I sure would like them to tell students that they did it wouldn't you that's my big concern I don't know whether you can see this it says and now Randy by use of song the male sparrow <laughs> okay will stake out his territory an instinct common in the lower animals. And what's the joke in that? All the fences. <laughs> I'm going to stake out my territory. But put a fence down between me and you. Anyway, I get, I get tickled at uh, Gary Larson stuff. But they go from all of these patterns that we find in all of these organisms, and then they go back and they say this is the primitive pattern. There's no, this is, doesn't exist anywhere. It just, this is the only thing that exists, and they're all modern. And I don't mind if they do that. I just would like for them to tell the students that they're doing that. But watch this, and you'll see what I'm saying. They look at all that similarity in the forelimbs, and it says the, the conclusion is inescapable that the limb bones of man, the bat, and the whale are modifications of a common ancestral pattern. The facts admit of no other logical interpretation. Difference between fact and interpretation, right? This showed up for a long time in the books. Now they don't write it that way. But it's still the same idea. So he says the forelimbs of all four-legged vertebrates exhibit a unity of anatomical pattern that you can understand only on the basis of common inheritance. So there's the dogmatic statement based on their interpretation. It's the only way to look at it, and general evolution is the only way that you can explain it. I don't believe that at all. 
So we have to figure out why God would have created things so similar, right? There has to be some interpretation that would allow us to go that direction. So hang on. Uh, well, that is hard to read. Um, I just want you to know about this book because you can still get it. Science and Creation, a view from the National Academy of Sciences. They still publish this. It has been revised. I have the first version. I have the last version. I've read them. These are the things I read. It's the science books I read, not somebody else's work. But anyway, what they're saying is these homologies, they make the same point up here that was made on that other chart. Okay, so we don't need to read that. So let's talk about the special theory. This was actually uh, from a book by G.A. Kirkcutt. Dr. Kirkcutt was the general editor of an advanced series of monographs on pure and applied biology. He's British, okay? And he wrote this book that was very interesting because he took all the areas just like my professor presented to me, and he explained it in two interpretations. And he made the distinction between special evolution and general evolution. He didn't talk about chemical, but at that time he talked about special and general. So I want you to know that when I say special evolution and general evolution, that that did not come from a creationist. In fact, most creationists do not like the fact that I use those terms. But since they came from a prominent scientist, it seemed like that was a little more solid, that people would buy that a little bit better. Plus, that had been my, that'd been my tact all along. I just take what's there. The theory that states that many living animals and plants can be observed over time to undergo changes so that new species are formed. That can be called the special theory of evolution, and it can be demonstrated in certain cases by experiment. That's a fact. <coughs> All right. So later on, when we talk about genetics, we'll talk about cockroaches. And I'll tell you about this cockroach room out at one of the colleges, but I won't do that right now. Uh, but if you want to get rid of your cockroaches, what do you do? <laughs> How do you get rid of them? You what? You kill them. How do you kill them? What do you use to kill them? A poison in like a spray can? Way to go, man. Uh, so you got a spray can, you got all these roaches, and you just start spraying. All right, so do you kill them all? Of course you don't kill them all. <laughs> That's why you buy spray cans like that every year. But the point is, it may look like you've killed them all. And you have killed all of them that were not resistant to that spray. But what we know, as a matter of fact, is there are always some that are resistant to the spray. Same thing that happens with uh, antibiotics, right? There's a, they're always having to create a new antibiotic or two that can only be given through a pick line in the hospital, all right? You can't take it home. When my son had this, had spinal meningitis, um, it probably was a viral one, but he still had to be treated as though it wasn't. And uh, they put him on vancomycin and robocephin or something, I don't know. It was a couple of things I'd never heard about. Now, those are, those have, they have been violated. They have some, some of these organisms have found a way to, to live through that. So they have to create more stuff all the time. Medicines like that, antibiotics that can only be used in a hospital and only administered by a physician, a, a nurse under the order of the physician. And the reason is that bacteria, all the resistant ones, die out. And then there are the bacteria that are most resistant they form populations, and then you have to deal with that. There's always this resistance factor. I mean, we're all talking about it with viruses, which you can't, you can't do antibiotics on viruses. But, you know, all of a sudden we find out that our flu shot was only 40%. Is that what it was? 40% effective? Now, I just want to say this. That means that if you get it, 40% of the time, you're going to knock out whatever it is you have. 
you got to be careful in just saying, ah, it's not effective. I'm not going to do it. So I took it. So, so far, no flu. Well, I can't knock on wood. That's a superstition, isn't it? Well, anyway, this is the special theory of evolution. Cattle, we do it with cattle all the time, do we not? We breed them and they change. All right. Dogs all came from wolves. Most of us are aware of that. Okay. You may not be aware of this, but wild mustard gave rise to broccoli, cauliflower, cabbage, Brussels sprouts, kale, and kohlrabi. And I like the wild mustard not to eat, but I don't like it as much anymore now that I know what they got from it. All of these things are different, and genetically, we got them from wild mustard. What's the difference between that and Darwin finches? One set of finches that led to 13 finches. That's not an issue. The issue is whether you can go from a single cell to a human and a butterfly and an elephant and a whale. That's the big, that's the big flow. That's general evolution. This is not a problem. What we have shown, and I'll go over this more than once, we have shown that you can genetically manipulate organisms through breeding to move them in certain directions. But we have always found a limit. And if you ask the breeders, they will tell you that. You can take a horse and breed it for speed. All right. But if you put that horse back out in the wild population, it will either die or it will bounce back. It's that simple. It will not continue to go. We've never been able to show that it, you could continue to go. And species and things like that, those are all sort of our own inventions for explaining the variety of things we have around us. So anyway, I don't see any difference, and I have no problem with this. If this is what happened, this is what happened. But there's never been anybody that has shown that a reptile could become a bird. Not ever. And we will talk about that a little later. So you can talk about all these horses, which basically were found in the same layers of rocks. But uh, I don't have any problem with it. I'll grant that argument. I just have no problem with it. So we'll come back to that. And these are dogs and all the different kind of dogs we have through artificial selection. How interesting. What did Darwin call his concept? Natural selection. How amazing. Same thing. You can do it artificially. It can happen in nature. But it has limits to it. And that's what I'm going to teach you over this period. I can show you this over and over. Oh, I love these. They are weird. Uh, this one particularly, some kind of rat. I'm not, <laughs> not exactly sure there. There are some really weird ones. I'm, I'm sorry, but I got really interested in some of these things. This uh, lost weight. Big, <laughs> biggest loser, one, winner of biggest loser right here. I, I'm sorry. I know this is really a little bit silly, but sometimes they say that we begin to look like our pets. Evil. Evil mean loud barking, sharp tooth, rat. Okay. Now, what I want, here's what I want to show you is why would we believe that God would put all of this variety out there? Okay, there has to be a reason for all the variety. And we already know that they have to feed on one another. And people just, I actually had that professor say in the class, if I were God, I would. I would have, you know, my thought was, if I were God, I would have made you without a mouth. <laughs> you know? But neither one of us were God, right? Remember, I did like this professor. Here's a cell, a, a core, core representation of an individual cell. If you will look at the structure of a cell and you watch the, the development from one cell to an organism, you'll go back to understanding miracles because you will not be able to fathom the changes that take place. It's just amazing. But anyway, we you can use the word amazing or you can use the word miracle. All these membrane systems, and they all pinch off and they go someplace else, and that membrane becomes part of another organelle. Kind of amazing. They're interchangeable. 
it's like, hey, go back there and fill that door. And it goes back there and fills the door. Would you consider that a miracle? Probably. All right, so we have the cell. We have DNA. Most of us know about DNA. Starch and glycogen and cellulose. These are three major molecules that we need, okay? Um, amino acids, protein. This is the basis of all proteins and enzymes. Uh, you have much more protein in your body that is not structural protein than you do uh, structural protein. Like, we tend to think only of protein for our muscles. And it's just atoms put together in the molecules and bent and twisted and so on. And they all stay in place that way. The reason that you die when you get too hot or too cold is that you break all the little bonds that hold this together, and they all just come apart, and the enzymes don't work anymore. That's pretty much it. Oh, isn't it interesting? We have to live in this little, this little part of the temperature range, and that's all we can do. I don't know. All right, kids, what is it? Somebody raised their hand, tell me what it is. Any of the younger? Who said that? Got it. This is a food chain. This happens to be an Antarctic food chain. So what's the purpose of showing somebody a food chain like that in school? What are you trying to show them? How energy keeps flowing and how does it keep flowing? Where do we, what did you eat tonight? Did you get dinner? No. <laughs> All right, I need, I need some self-satisfied person who's nodding off to tell me what you actually ate at dinner. Bean soup? Oh. Why bean soup? What is it in beans? What were you looking for? Huh? Protein. Well, you've got protein. You've got, you've got carbohydrates. Yeah, you've got most of it in there. There's, there's even fat in there, but I won't go into that. We have pretty much the same molecules that we need. And what do we do? We break them down, and then we burn them in our mitochondria to produce energy to keep us living and to, and to produce other little parts to put back into the ones we need. That's how it works, all right? So if this is true, that means that every organism has to be alike. If you're going to use something else as a food source, then the cells have to be the same, and the molecules have to be the same. And no matter how you package that thing, if it is your food source, it is that way because you have to have it that way. Everyone, everyone has to have a food source. Mine is chocolate. That's, that's kind of it. It has protein in it, doesn't it? <laughs> Does the dark chocolate have protein in it? I guess not. I've cut the sugar down as much as I can, but I can't get past the chocolate stuff. Anyway, uh, this is the reason that all this stuff is alike. It's the simplest explanation that I know. You couldn't have eaten dinner. You couldn't have had bean soup and lived off of it if it wasn't made of molecules you could use. And they're the same everywhere. So my point is very simple. Somebody can say uh, that this is why the similarity is there, et cetera, et cetera. It's all genetic and so on. And genetics are involved in it. But on the other hand, why it happens is because we have to eat. Every organism has to eat. If you made every organism different, it would have to have a different food source, which you never created. But God created this world for there to be a huge food web. And that's what we used to eat, and that's what everybody else uses to eat. So you have, I didn't hear the term for this. You said food web, didn't you? Yeah. yeah. So there are food chains within the food web, and lots of things may feed off that. Most of you have heard about krill. This is basically, it looks like a crawdad kind of lobster. But the krill actually are eaten by lots and lots of different things. You see the lines coming off of it? <laughs> Whales eat it, for instance. Seems odd. You'd think they'd like chocolate. But anyway, 
Now, what have I done here? Well, I've given you the evidence without any interpretation. I've tried to explain about these differences uh, in the idea of evidence and interpretation. And I've given you an example of it. And at the beginning, I gave you the difference in the how many theories of evolution? Three theories. Who wants to take a shot at telling them back to you? Chemical, Chemical which is life from non-life. General, which is the big scope of sort of life to all life. And special, which is the idea of natural selection, right? Same thing we do in artificial selection, just it's in a natural setting. But always with limits. So these are the two things that I'm going to be trying to nail home through this whole thing. I will try to give you evidence, and I will give you the strongest evolutionary interpretation I can of the evidence and then I will turn around and I will try to give you my strongest explanation of the evidence from the standpoint of God having created and what the Bible says. You know, I have someone in my family who's an atheist. <clears throat> um, they don't live close. They are close personally. People, people that we love dearly because they love, they love us, and we love them. However, they have an entirely different view of the universe. So uh, I have great difficulty with that, and the only place I know where to start with that is with love. You know, you can come up with a lot of explanations. You know, some people believe that I'm here just because my molecules were bouncing around and I showed up, you know. That's it. I mean, it's all like a big pool table. Pow, big bang, and everything just goes, and it's totally predictable if you have all of the things, all the uh, things laid out, like a big computer thing. But uh, I don't believe that. I believe that we are uniquely human. We are different from the animals. We're not just an anomaly of animals. We are something different, yet we look like animals. We are animals. We feed off of animals and plants. But when I start with people on the concept of love, I always go back to this one young professor that has come in to teach. And I like him so much. And I love his kids. His wife is a wonderful person. And uh, he had a map up on his wall in his office. And uh, I liked it. It was an old map. And I said, Stephen, where did where'd you get that map? And he said, well, my wife gave it to me as a birthday present. And he said, she, she loves it and I love it, so I put it up in the office. I said, cool. And then later on I came back because I noticed that he had a sticker on his door that said, DNA is life, the rest is translation." took me forever, but I finally found that online so I could put it into my presentations. And I thought about that for a long time. So one day I just stopped him. I said, Stephen, I just want to ask you a question. You know, you said that you love your wife. You love your children. I know you do. You love that map. Now, is that DNA that causes you to do it, or is it just translation? He never had an answer for it. I didn't ask him to give it. I said, just something for you to think about. You can't just go back to DNA, and you cannot go back to just the physical mechanics of how bodies form and explain love. And God is love. And if there is any light that we are reflecting in the world, it is love. People come at you as an enemy. They despitefully use you. And you are to love them and not return it. You cannot return it to them. That is the difference between the Old Testament and New Testament Christianity. And I wish I had time to talk about that because <clears throat> God talked directly to the heads of the family, and that did not work. The people asked for a law, and so he gave Abraham's seed a law, which he knew they would not be able to keep. You can't get to heaven by 
a law. You can't keep a law perfectly to get to heaven. Jesus did. He's the only one I think the Bible has ever said did it, and he became, he became our Lord, and he gave us the opportunity to be forgiven of our sins. The Gentiles, he kind of let them go. Everybody other than the Jews, the seed of Abraham, he kind of let them go. He, they were really still under the patriarchal dispensation. It's just nobody was listening anymore. They didn't listen to God. I'm not saying that nobody did. I'm just saying the sweep of time showed that the bulk of those people never listened to God. When they went about to create a righteousness of their own, they blew it. They ended up worshiping trees and lizards and bean soup, and whatever else they wanted to worship. So then Jesus comes, and he dies for our sins and the sins of people who have lived on this earth. And then he says, you can't do it with the physical kingdom, you can't do it with the physical law, but you can do it in the spirit through a spiritual law and the grace of God. And none of that kind of stuff, like love, none of it can be explained biologically. And if it can, it kind of takes the romance out of that person you're loved with. Uh, we're all chemical. And it's just <laughs> my chemistry is attracted to your chemistry. <laughs> Nothing more. Kind of takes it out of there, doesn't it? Now, I can talk all night long. Everybody knows that. So I'm going to stop right there. I gave you the three theories. We'll go back over that umpteen times, particularly when we get back to genetics. We'll deal with natural selection. <clears throat> and I've given you comparative anatomy and shown you what my pattern is going to be. I'm going to start with evidence. I'm going to give you the very best, the very best argument from general evolutionary uh, thinking. And then I'm going to give you the very best interpretation that I think I can give by including everything the Bible talks about. Not just science, but everything the Bible tells us. Now, from a personal perspective, I just want to say this. Uh, if it had not been for me going back to the Bible, I grew up in a denomination, and I loved the people. They, uh, they were good people, and they taught me a lot about love and about Jesus. I didn't learn a lot of scripture, though. When I went back and I started studying the scripture, they had taken me this far, and then I started studying the scripture when I realized what I needed to do. And when I realized that the promise in the scriptures is not just having your sins forgiven and the opportunity to go to heaven, but to live a happy, joyful life. <laughs> to have a good time, but to have it right. Do it right and have joy in your life for the rest of your life. And someone to take care of you because God's at your right hand all the time. If you want to talk to God, get in your car tonight, pretend he's in that passenger seat, just talk to him. That's all it takes. That's kind of what prayer is. I mean, how, how wonderful it is to have a God that is alive, that actually is concerned about me. Seems almost incredible, doesn't it? That there could be a God that cares about me and cares about what happens to me. And the way he's treated me with his grace and mercy that's the way I need to treat everybody else, no matter what they do to me. If you can do that, then you understand the concept of Christianity. If you want to fight and argue all the time, well, there's somebody else out there that's probably got a bit of a hold on you. i got to stop for you, not me. So if there are questions, let's do it this way. If you have some questions, I'll take five questions, and then people can just leave. If you want to hang around, that's fine. I always hang around. Generally, I never, you hate to hear this, I never leave for probably an hour after because people are.